It never fails every year with the NFL draft. There are going to be certain narratives about certain positions. Sometimes they're accurate and on money and on the point, and sometimes they're not. I go back to 2013 and the narrative about that running back class and how that running back class wasn't all that particularly good. You know, and I kind of bought into that narrative just a little bit, and I shouldn't have. I should have been wiser than that, and I should have been able to see past that. But I didn't, and that's part of the thing you learn from those type of mistakes. You go back to that 2013 running back class with guys like Le'Veon Bell and Eddie Lacy, well, certainly those would be two guys you would be exploring taking in round number one, probably higher in round number one even, um, especially with the weakness overall of that 2013 NFL draft, which was an accurate and correct narrative at that time and most certainly has proven to be now. You know, so sometimes the narratives work and make sense and sometimes they're wrong and off the money and off the point. And a lot of the narratives you've heard about the edge rushers in particular, you know, when I'm saying edge rushers more so those guys that project best maybe to be in three, four outside linebackers at the NFL level, is that this is a really good class. This is a really deep and really loaded class. You've got marquee talent at the top. You've got good depth in the middle. And you've even got some potential sleepers late in the draft, so on and so forth. And that's kind of been the buzz. And that's kind of been the talking point for months about this class. And for a while, I kind of bought into this a little bit. But as I dug deeper, and as I look closer, and as I examine this class more, I find that, in my opinion, to be a false narrative. I do not think this class of edge rushers is as good, nearly as good as many people make it out to be. I think there is some talent at the top, but once you get past maybe the first six, seven, eight guys, I think there is a big time drop off. I really, truly do. And furthermore, I don't think there's as many great day three finds as many people are trying to tell you and convince you of with this year's draft. And I don't think this edge rush class is as good as many people want you to believe. Now, in terms of this edge rusher class, you know, this is kind of one of these positions that I feel like I'll be vindicated somewhat when it comes to the NFL draft in terms of the way that guys are ranked, in particular the way I've got the top three guys ranked. For quite a while now, I think I view Dante Fowler Jr. out of Florida as my number one edge rusher in this 2015 NFL draft. There was a time where I flirted with Shane Ray as that because I thought he was the most explosive guy. Uh, but as I went through and studied more and more, I backed off of that. And I've been very consistent, I think, in viewing Dante Fowler as that number one edge rusher. The reason I think he rates out as the number one edge rusher in this draft is because he's the most balanced and he's most complete. Now, sometimes that could be a bit of a concern because at the end of the day, you're drafting an edge rusher to do what? Rush the passer. And when you start talking about his ability to play the run and his ability to drop back in coverage and versatility, maybe you're masking for the fact that he's not that great of an edge rusher. Well, what I saw to Dante Fowler at Florida was a guy who was able to consistently get into the backfield, who does a tremendous job of utilizing his hands at a damn near defensive end type of level at the NFL level. Really, really good with his hand usage. A guy that is very explosive and athletic coming off of the outside. Uh, sometimes I think he missed out on some sacks because maybe his hip flexibility wasn't what it needed to be, and that is something that will need to be worked on at the NFL level. But I think he does the best job in this class of setting the edge. I think he does the best job in this class of using his hands. I think he uses his power the best out of Eddie Edge Rusher in this year's draft class and that's why I have him as the number one prospect. Uh, number two might surprise some of you, but maybe shouldn't if you've been following me for a while. I've got Bud Dupree from Kentucky as my number two edge rusher. Part of the thing that I think hurts Bud Dupree as a prospect in terms of some people's minds is the fact that he played against so many spread teams in 2014 at Kentucky that it was sometimes hard to evaluate him as an edge rusher because he had to sit there and set the edge, and he had to sit there and keep contained so often. Here's also a guy that lined up all over the place. He was at left, and he was at right, and he was a stand-up backer. Sometimes they'd play him in the middle. Sometimes they'd line him up over the uh, guard or the center. You know, He would line up all over the place. He'd play out in the freaking slot, covering tight ends and slot receivers. So he was kind of like a jack of all trades, perhaps a master of none. But when I look at a Bud Dupree, I see a guy that once he gets into the right place and once he gets that one position and he's allowed to stick with it, I think this is a guy that will surprise people with just how good he will be at the NFL level. And for my money, based off of his size, based off of his superior strength, I do have him ranked above Vic Beasley as an edge rusher in this year's class. 
I think he's a guy that's pretty much almost as explosive as Vic Beasley, but he's stronger and I think he's more physical. I still think Vic Beasley could be a very good edge rusher at the NFL level. Sometimes I wonder if he'd be better off as a 4-3 Sam backer, maybe that Leo type of position, uh, more so than he would be a 3-4 outside linebacker. He was a guy that's a physical stud. He's been a productive pass rusher the past few years at Clemson. You know, at times they utilized him more as a as an end with his hand in the dirt, so sometimes it can be hard to evaluate him as a prospect. I think he's a guy that's more of middle of the first round type of prospect than he is a top five or top ten in this draft type of prospect. But again, that's just me. I do think that those three guys are the cream of this edge rush crop. And I wouldn't be surprised at all come the 2015 NFL draft if the first three edge rushers you see go off the board are Dante Fowler, Bud Dupree, and Vic Beasley in that particular order. Now in terms of this edge rusher class, I didn't put in defensive ends such as like Lyndon Trail and Anthony Chiquillo and guys like that. Um, and maybe even like Owa Odigizua and Preston Smith because I project them more so as defensive ends, pure defensive ends at the NFL level. When I'm saying edge rushers, I'm focusing more so on pure kind of three, four outside linebackers or four, three strong side backers that could play in that Sam backer or play in that Leo role, if you will. Um, the number four guy on my board is actually Nate Orchard from Utah. Here's a guy that doesn't test out the best. He's not the quickest. He's not the fastest. But there's a lot that you like about him, I think, when you watch him. And the more you watch him, the more you like him, the more you see this type of guy being just an unheralded type of productive NFL player. Now, he'll probably go somewhere to the mid to late portion of round two, even on to the mid, early to mid portion of round number three. But here's a guy that I think long term could end up panning himself out to play like he was a first round pick and should have been a first round pick. Now I've got Shane Ray at number five and the reason I've got Shane Ray at number five is very simple. I do have some questions about whether or not he can actually play outside in a 3-4 but I have other questions. And you're talking about he has a toe injury coming into this draft. That's at least somewhat of a concern. Number two, you have a questions about the fact that he comes from a system that last year produced Coney Ely and Michael Sam um, at the same type of position, and they really didn't do much at the NFL level in 2014. That's most certainly for sure. Uh, also, he had Marcus Golden on the other side, who I think has been a bit of an overrated prospect as well, but that most certainly doesn't hurt. Maybe it was the utilization of him in that Missouri defense. But then you've also got the questions about judgment. I mean, right before the NFL draft, you're getting popped off for marijuana. Right before the draft. I mean, how incredibly stupid can you be? And that is a concern. Look, I still think Shane Ray will go somewhere in the 20s in this draft. And the reason I think that is because there are going to be teams that look at him and say that he's worth the gamble because he is a guy explosive in terms of explosiveness, in terms of pure athletic ability. He is a top 10 talent in this draft. And he's worth the gamble at 20 be in the 20s because he could take you over the hump potentially. Maybe a team like Cincinnati views him as that type of guy. But to me, I'm not touching him with a 10-foot pull with a top 10 pick or even a top 20 pick at this point because, again, that judgment, that poor, piss-poor judgment, combining that with the concerns about scheme fit. When I look at him, I see some Jared Allen, and I think he actually could play 4-3 end, maybe more so a 3-4 outside linebacker. If you play him as a 3-4 outside linebacker, maybe he's a bit of Bjorn Werner, which kind of concerns me. Um, in this case, I still have him as a number five edge rusher in this draft. But like I said, I wouldn't be touching him anywhere before like pick 21 or 22 on through to 32 in round one. I still think he's a first round talent. I, I just have some reservations and concerns about him. Now, one prospect that I have been consistent on throughout this entire draft prospect process has been Randy Gregory out of Nebraska. I've never gotten it. I've never understood it. I've never seen it. And sometimes that's just the way it is. Every year there are those certain guys that are incredibly overrated and overhyped by the media for whatever reason, and then the reality of their draft position ends up being entirely different. Now, for a while, I viewed Randy Gregory as a second-round draft prospect, and that was just solely based off of the film. I thought he regressed in 2014 as a player instead of progress. Here's a guy that I looked at that was maybe 230, 235 pounds, absolutely soaking wet. Here's a guy that I had serious concerns about whether or not he could actually make the conversion to being a 3-4 outside linebacker. Here's also a guy that have concerns in part because of his inability to play with power consistently, his inability to set the edge at 230, 235 pounds. Here's a guy that reminds me a lot of Jarvis Jones, but not as explosive, and that's not necessarily a good comparison. Now you take the failed marijuana test, 
the marijuana problems, you take the knee injury, you take the problems with him being able to maintain weight, some of the reports of him not interviewing very well, some other concerns, and now I feel vindicated in saying that Randy Gregory is a second-round prospect in this year's draft. And in fact, I think he's more of a day-two prospect than he is even necessarily a second-round type of prospect. I think people are going to be surprised with exactly where Randy Gregory goes. I could be totally ass wrong. He could still go in the top 25 or top 30 in this draft, but I doubt it. I'd be stunned. I just think there are too many red flags, too many concern areas for you to sit there and risk a first-round pick on him. I think he's more of a day two pick than he is a second round pick. And what I mean by that is he might be more likely to be a third round pick or a late second round pick as opposed to a guy that's picked in the top half or the top portion of round number two. And I think that's about where he should be drafted. Even without some of the concerns, you throw some of those concerns in. I might not be touching Randy Gregory at all. I might be pulling him off of my draft board completely if I'm a certain team. You know, if anything else at this point in time, the one thing I'm happy about is that he dropped the stock enough to where I can feel relatively confident that the Chicago Bears will not be touching this guy with the 10th foot pole with the 7th overall pick. And my God, that makes my day. One guy that I think in this draft could end up overplaying his draft position in part because of concerns that people might have about him is Haloi Kakaha from Washington. Here's a guy that is an explosive edge rusher, played on a very good defense with guys like Danny Shelton and Marcus Peters and Shaq Thompson at Washington in 2014. Uh, but you look at this guy. This is a guy that has the ability to play with strength, play with some explosiveness, play with some quickness, and has the ability to get to the quarterback. But he's more than just a guy that can rush the quarterback, in my opinion. Part of the concern with him, though, is the fact that this is a guy that has torn his ACL twice. You know, you're also talking about a guy about six foot, six foot one, 250 pounds. You know, is he really athletic enough laterally to play outside in a 3-4? Is he ever going to be big enough or strong enough to play defensive end in a 4-3? Is he going to be durable enough to hold up considering he's already torn his ACL twice? That leads me to think that this is a guy, in terms of talent, that is a second to third round type of guy, could end up being a day three type of pick. But he could end up being one of those outstanding day three picks. He gets into the right system, the right scheme, a place like Baltimore would be a perfect place for him. He could take over the Pernell McPhee type of role. And here's a guy that could be a long-term productive player at the NFL level that far exceeds his um, draft position. But again, I've got my rankings for the edge rushers. And like I said, what I mean again by edge rushers are three, four outside linebackers or four, three outside linebackers that will be in that Sam backer or Leo backer type of role at the NFL level. Their rankings are in the description box down below. I understand that for months you've had it pounded in your head that this is a really good edge rusher class and that this is where there's going to be value and talent all throughout. I just don't necessarily agree with that assessment. I think some guys are going to be really good and some guys are going to really bust out. One thing that really should concern you about this year's edge rushing class uh, for all the positive talk about them is the fact that none of these guys does a tremendous job of playing with power. You know, even the Fowlers, the Duprees, the Beasleys, the Rays, none of them do. None of the marquee guys play with great power. And that's something that the most successful three, four outside linebackers have to have. They have to have some type of power element to their game. And this is something that all of these guys struggle with. So for so many people to sit there and say this is such a great class, you have to sit there and point that out. Well, that's most, one of the most important things that a 3-4 outside linebacker can have. Some of these guys will be productive. A couple of them I think will be stars at the NFL level. But I don't think when you look back at this class in two or three years that this edge rusher class was going to be nearly as good as it was made out to be.